Today is my older son John's 39th birthday. Good grief. <laughs> Whew, what does that make? In case you were wondering, Karen was 10 when he was born. <laughs> Oh, of course, I said something about that to my mother, and she said, how about having a kid who's on Medicare? <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, boy. I want you to know I wrestled with today's lesson for, for quite a bit. It's a, it's, a very, it's a fascinating lesson to me. It's a very interesting lesson. We're on Psalms 38 and 39. I'm going to introduce it in a rather unorthodox way, and I'm going to finish in an even un more unorthodox way because it's, it's kind of an unorthodox lesson. I had an aha moment uh, in the lesson that uh, I think God intended for me to share. Uh, the, for, as, as a way of introduction, I want you to know that the ninth chapter of John is, is a, a story that's really one of my favorite stories in Scripture because to me it's the most beautiful testimony in all of Scripture. And if you'll recall, as Jesus and his disciples were walking along, they saw a man who was blind from birth. Um, and, and this is the one where Jesus spat in the dirt, and made a little paste, and rubbed it in his eyes, and told the man to go wash it off, and he was healed. The Sanhedrin, uh, wanting to trap Jesus, called the man in, remember, and asked if Jesus was a, was a heretic, or if he was, you know, all kinds of things about him, and, and uh, if he was a blasphemer. And, and, and the man, who was an uneducated man, said, you know what? I don't know, but I do know that I was blind and now I see. Talk about an eloquent, beautiful testimony. But the first, of the, the first part of, of chapter 9 is what I really want to zero in on today uh, because I think it's very germane to what we have to say in both Psalms. John 9, 1 through 3, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Turn to Psalm 38, if you will. There's a superscript there. What does it say? Who wrote it? A Psalm of David. It is a petition. Uh, in Christian tradition, there are seven or six, depending on who you listen to, penitential psalms. Uh, this is my word for the week. I spring a word every week on you. This is my word for the week, penitential. Uh, does it sound something like the word penitentiary? Well, that's because it comes from the same root word of penitent, which means I'm sorry. And the idea behind a, a penitentiary is kind of like a big people time out that uh, you go sit in the corner and think about it until you realize what you've done. So a a penitent psalm, a penitential psalm, is one where the person who's writing the psalm is confessing his sins, is coming clean before God. That's very important, and that's one of the key parts of the, of the lesson today. So uh, please note that, that, that actually during both psalms could be considered, although the, the 39th is not normally ranked in there with the penitential psalms, it's very similar. So these two psalms, though written under different circumstances, completely different times, have a lot in common. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath, for your arrows have pierced me and your hand has come down upon me. Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. My bones have no soundness because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. What I like to do when we're looking at each one of these psalms individually is to try as best I can to tell where was David when, this, when he wrote this? What were the circumstances that prompted him to write them? Quite frequently, if you'll recall, we can't pinpoint it too closely, and that is certain the, certainly the case here. Because David had an awful lot of trouble in his life, uh, and this was a time of trouble for him. Uh, I will posit, it, it's my opinion, that this was written perhaps near the end of his life. Because we know that right before David's death, uh, he was bedridden. Uh, he, he was very old, couldn't get around very well. Uh, all his bones ached, it said. And that fits very well with the general tenor and tone. Although, you know, I must give you a warning here that this could, uh, could have happened at many different times in his life. But we do know that, that he was feeling down spiritually, physically, and mentally. Because you could tell very plainly from this. What has overwhelmed him? His guilt. 
He says, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome. Now, we don't know if those are physical wounds, if he actually has some, some festering wound, or it would be just as apropos if he were talking about his spiritual wounds. But they fester, and then he says something that fascinates me, because when it comes to penitence, I think we've lost this element. Why is he suffering? He says, because of my sinful folly. Here's what he says, my own fault. Folly is something foolish because of my foolishness. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. Isn't this psalm just a ray of sunshine? He's suffering. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. All my longings lie open before you, O Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. So here's what he's saying. You think God doesn't know he's sick? He knows that God knows he's sick. But still, he's going to say, God, I'm in awful shape. And I'm laying my heart bare before you. File that away because we're going to talk more about that a little bit later when it comes to penitence, when it comes to a confession before God. I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish. And once again, all my longings lie before you. My heart pounds. My strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. It's, I don't know about you, but when I first read that immediately, who came to your mind? Job. Exactly. Because I thought of the, the similarity in the circumstances when Job had lost all his physical possessions and then his health. And then his friends pretty much walked away from him except the ones who wanted to come back and lecture him. So he said, all my friends have gone away, from, have avoided me. My neighbors stay far away. Those who seek my life set their traps. The last couple of verses are why I think perhaps this was toward the end of his life. Because I, I know that you'll recall that at one time... Uh, uh, David's son Absalom tried to usurp his throne. You may not remember that right at the very end of his life that another son, Adonijah, uh, the next son, himself uh, raised an, a, a small army of like 50 men but started masquerading as the king. And so, the, the, let me tell you, the vultures were sitting on the limb just waiting for him to die. And that's what he refers to when he says, those who seek my life set their traps. Those who would harm me talk of my ruin. All day long they plot deception. I am like a deaf man who cannot hear, like a mute who cannot open his mouth. I've become like a man who does not hear, whose mouth can offer no reply. He's at the point in his life where he's saying, look, it's not doing me any good to argue with these people. Uh, they're shouting me down. I'm just going to sit and take what comes my way. I wait for you, O Lord. You will answer me. You talk about someone who's reached the end of his rope. He's hanging on to the last knot in the rope. And he says, Lord, my health, my physical health is gone. Uh, my spiritual health, health is waning. Uh, my mental health, I've been in depression. Uh, and I'm at the point where I can say nothing. And so I'm just waiting on you. I said, do not let them gloat or exalt themselves over me when my foot slips. For I'm about to fall, and my pain is ever with me. Does it sound like a man who's near the end of his life and in desperation? Sure. I confess my iniquity. I am troubled by my sin. Now, isn't that a strange change of direction? He's, he's asking for God to listen to him, to listen to his petitions. Uh, he's, he's enumerating his illnesses. And then he says something very interesting. I confess my iniquity. That's the first part of penitence. That's the first part of confession. I confess. I did it. Have you noticed, particularly it seems like among celebrities these days, the celebrity confession du jour always contains the I did it. But you don't often see the next part, I am troubled by my sin. More often you see, I'm troubled that I got busted. But what's David's confession? It bothers him that he had to confess to begin with. It bothered him. What was the cause of the confession? His sin. His sin bothers him. I'm troubled by it. Many are those who are my vigorous enemies. 
Those who hate me without reason are numerous. Those who repay my good with evil slander me when I pursue what is good. And then as he's holding on to the last knot in the rope, what does he cry? O oh Lord, do not forsake me. Be not far away from me, O oh my God. Come quickly to help me, O oh Lord and Savior. So when we talk about a, a, a prayer, a psalm, a song of penitence, I hope that you see that this is coming before God and coming clean. And this is really kind of a model. If you want to know to confess your own sins, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, this is a model where he says, I realize the cause of my troubles. Now, in Psalm 39, we're going to take just a, a little different tack, and, and it is no more sunshiny than Psalm 38 is. Uh, it is a psalm written and sung out of despair. The superscript uh, tells us a little bit about it. For whom is it written? Philip May. It's, it's written for the director of music. Now, here's what was interesting to me for Jejutun. Jejutun. And many of the superscripts in the Psalms, we don't have a really good background on. Jejutun, we do. Because if you search through Chronicles, uh, 1 Chronicles 16, 41, you will find out that three men are named as being the worship leaders in the tabernacle. And Jejutun was one of them. So apparently, David penned this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as a song. As you read through it, you say, what? What kind of song is this? But this was intended to be sung by the congregation. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth. I want to stop and just let that soak in. Um, I think over my years of being a Baptist, the number of things that Baptists single out as sin... Um, and we're real good at that, picking out other people's sins. Um, but i got to tell you, some of the biggest gossip I've ever seen anywhere goes on at church. James tells us probably more than any, any other piece of Scripture about the damage that the tongue can do. And the danger there is uh, in gossip. And the harm that words can do. And when David comes before God to confess his sins, he says, I'm going to watch my ways. I'm going to quit philandering. All the things that David was most certainly guilty of, what's the one he singled out in this case? i got to watch my mouth. And talk about getting graphic. Uh, I wish I could give you a, um, a, a, the best description from the Hebrew, but muzzle is about as good as it gets. Uh, if you just look at the little cage you might put over a pit bull's face to keep it from biting, he says, you know, I put a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence. That's an interesting qualifier because he's saying, you know, it's bad enough that I talk in front of the, the righteous but he said, I don't want to give the unrighteous any ammunition and hear my lips, hear my mouth run. But when I was silent and still, not even saying anything good, my anguish increased. So David is saying, okay, I did the first part. I'm not going to speak. I put a muzzle on myself. But, you know, even that wasn't enough because I was more anguished and my heart grew hot within me. As I meditated, the fire burned and then I spoke. And this is what he said to God. Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as of nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Selah. What does selah mean? Remember? Take a break. Pause. Well, let's do that. Let's stop and think. Did he just not say what Jay and Catherine Wolfe said this morning? This means yes. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. And if you haven't heard them yet, you will be really blessed. Uh, they say something that I've learned, I think, kind of the hard way over my life is I used to be really impatient about like I'd get a cold and I'd just be, okay, when's this going to be over? When's this going to be over? Uh, get the flu. Uh, you know, after surgery, you know, when I had my hip replaced, oh, how long is this going to take? I don't do that anymore. 
I really don't. One of the things that comes with age is I've learned, you know what? Some things take a while, and I can wait it out. You know, I'm just going to I'm just going to keep plodding along. And here's the ultimate end to that is that as bad as things seem today, my whole life is a blip on the continuum of eternity. So whatever suffering, whatever evil I encounter, whatever difficulties that fall my way this time uh, may seem overwhelming in the middle of my circumstances. But in the long picture of my walk with Christ I'm going to spend infinitesimally more time with him than I am in trouble. And that's what the wolves were talking about today. That's one of the things he says today. You know, my days are fleeting. The span of my years is nothing before you. Each man's life is a breath. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth not knowing who will get it. I wrote in, this, in, in my margin here, Ecclesiastes, because I've been doing a little reading in Ecclesiastes. It, I'll tell you, this is, uh, if Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, listen, his daddy, had some, he learned some of it from his daddy right here. Isn't there something just so futile about this? Man bustles about. Only in vain. Or as in, the, in Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So all the little plans, remember what we talked about, the Jewish proverb uh, several weeks back, uh, man makes plans and God laughs. That's pretty much what he's saying here. And, and then there's the one I just love. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. Because you're not taking it with you. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. I was silent. I would not open my mouth, for you're the one who's done this. Let me stop right here. He's got, he reveals something to us that we haven't seen heretofore. David is suffering. Why? God did it. God's revealed to him that he did it because look what happens next. Remove your scourge from me. I am overcome by the blow of your hand. So uh, I'm here to tell you that, that God has visited some physical problems on David. David realizes this. And he says, God, what I've done caused you to discipline me. And we're going to get to that in just a second. But please remove your hand from me. I'm overcome by the blow. You rebuke and discipline men for their sin. We're going to flesh that out just a little bit later. But David knows full well the consequences of his sin and that God does act in his life. The most noticeable time, will you remember uh, his dalliance with, and I even hate to use that because it was, I think, much more brutal than that. But uh, when, when he had sex, remember, outside of marriage? With Bathsheba, what did God do with that? He says, she's going to have a baby, but that baby's going to die. And so God intervened into David's life and punished him for his sin. You consume their wealth like a moth. Each man is but a breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Hear my cry for help. Be not deaf to my weeping, for I dwell with you as an alien, a stranger, as all my fathers were. Now, what follows is something that's really difficult, and I don't know what translation you're reading from, but mine says, look away from me that I may rejoice again. That was hard for me to get my head around, that, you know, that David would say, don't look at me so that I can be happy again. Um, a much better translation from the Hebrew is spare me. Look away from, actually, a better translation says, spare me, so that I may rejoice again before I depart and am no more. I don't know when the, my days will end, but I do want to be right with you when that happens. I had a chance to visit this week with a, a precious lady uh, who suffers from a complex set of illnesses uh, that have left her crippled and in constant pain. And during our visit, she asked me a very difficult question. Why is this happening to me? Is God punishing me for something? Why, 
And that's one of the parts of what I do, what God has called me to do, that's the most difficult for me. Because uh, people expect, you're a minister, you're a pastor. I want to know, is God doing this to me? Uh, and the difficulty is, I don't have that answer. But I thought of the incident in, in John 9 that we read to start the lesson today. Who sinned, this man or his parents? Does God use illness and pain to discipline us? Think about that. Does he use illness and pain to discipline us? Now, the answer is not easy. Because one thing that's obvious, pain and suffering exist because of the sin of disobedience by Adam and Eve. That's when it came into the world. One, sin came through the world through one man, Adam. We know that. Scripture tells us that. But on an individual level, does God cause us to suffer? Sometimes he does. Um, if you recall reading in 2 Chronicles, uh, King Uzziah uh, was feeling a little bit too big for his britches, too proud of himself, and God afflicted him uh, with leprosy because of his dip- disobedience. God gave him a horrible illness. Uh, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, he writes to the church at Corinth, and he tells them that some are suffering, some are sick, and some are even dying because they were taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. So did God inflict pain, suffering, and punishment on people? Absolutely, he did. Now, can you then extrapolate from that that if I am sick, it is because of my sin? No, you can't. Um, It could be. Could be. Well, so when I offer you that answer, I usually get this blank stare. Like, okay, well, what is it? How do I know? Well, you don't. But what you do is do what David did and go before the Lord in a spirit of of, of penitence. That's what you do. Now, I want to share something with you that, frankly, I'm a little embarrassed to share with you. Uh, Because a year and a half, two years ago, I had an aha moment. You know, a head slapper? You ever have one of those where you say... There it is, where little bits and pieces had been floating around in your head and something happened that congealed them all into a, a, something brilliant. And I had a head slapper while Karen and I were watching Dr. Phil. <laughs> what can I tell you? What can I tell you? But here's the, here's the circumstances. Uh, the story was about uh, a man who had been uh, serially unfaithful to his wife. And, and the guy was pretty much clueless, and, and, and he says, I told her I was sorry. Can't we just move on with it? I wish you could see the reactions of the men and the women in the room today. It's really interesting. Can't you just get over it? Well, obviously, he was clueless. But then Dr. Phil said something that was was really an aha moment for me in a complete another realm. And here's what he said. He said, here's what she wants to know. She doesn't want to just hear your apology. She wants to know that you get it, how much he hurt you. He wants you to get it, how much you hurt her, what you did to her. She wants to know that you get it. And I thought, that goes for me too. Wait a minute. And I think of casual confession. And I don't want to pick here on my Catholic brothers and sisters, but, you know, uh, forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. Well, okay, pray the rosary ten times and you're done. That, done lightly like that, that's casual confession. Okay, you got me. I'll admit it. Just tell me what i got to do. Let's get over it and go on. Do you think that maybe God wants to know that you get it? That you get it. And so since that time, in my prayer time, uh, 
Did you know that an integral part of your prayer time really needs to be confession? You know, we've got a model prayer. Forgive us our trespasses, works, sins, as we forgive those who... Okay. So part of our prayer ought to be forgive us of our sins. How about this prayer? Okay, God, I've sinned. Get over it. Let's move on. <laughs> Try that. Try that. And so as I look for little clues in the lives, it's, I'm sorry, in the life of a man called in Scripture after God's own heart, I say, why? And here's another little LED light flashing that tells me, here's why. Because he gets it. He gets it. And here's a concept that I don't know that we think about all that time. Sin hurts God's feelings. Did you ever stop to think about that? Sin is, all sin is ultimately against whom? It's not against your spouse. It's not against your enemy. It's not, it's not against your neighbor. All sin is ultimately, Joseph had a great handle on that when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. He said, I cannot sin against God. All sin is ultimately against God. A, a song by Ray Bolts that I, I, I used to just love called The Hammer uh, is sung uh, for, by a man who says, Who nailed him there, this child of peace and mercy? And then he closes the song by saying, I did. My sins nailed him there. The pain that we cause him with our sins must be incredible. And so I think too light an attitude about confession is not good for us. Because it's not effective. It's not sincere. It's an attitude of, well, I know the drill. You are faithful to forgive us, so just get over it. Okay, I did it. Enough. Can't we just go on to the next section? Not David. He wanted God to know that he got it. Are you being punished because of your sins when you're sick? Don't know. Don't know. Sometimes yes. I think most times not. We have sickness, we have illness, we have accidents, we have tragedy in our life because uh, it's a result of fallen mankind, because of our fractured relationship with God. But there are times when he's trying to get your attention. I'm here to tell you there was a time where I was sick to death in a hotel room. Have you ever been sick in a hotel? There's no sicker than sick in a hotel because your wife's not there and you can't say, I feel bad. <laughs> Nobody cares. Nobody's there. Who, the concierge could care less. You know, and God made me sick, made me get down on my knees and say, yes, Father, I will leave what I'm doing and go into the ministry. Absolutely, no doubt in my mind, that's what happened. If you've got a cold, if you've got uh, sinus problems, if you've got allergies, is that because of unconfessed sin in your life? Don't know. Don't know. But in case it is, what's the best remedy? Not Sinex nasal spray. <laughs> it's doing what you ought to do regularly anyway. And that's during your prayer time, confessing your sin. One thing that I love, and I'll close with this, is that I have just been praying earnestly for a young adult ministry in this church. And God has blessed us far beyond what I was, my meager faith had, had called for. God has just blessed so much the young, bringing young people as part of this ministry. Uh, most of it you won't see because many of them will not be here Sunday mornings. But what we're doing is have life, life transformation groups in homes, small groups. And here's, what's, here's the foundation on which these groups are built, confession. These people get together, get to know one another, uh, and confess their sins to God before each other. That's serious. Let me tell you what. What goes on here this morning is casual, but can you, can, you, you could be in this class because you wish to be anonymous. I know some of you might well be. 
Uh, you don't have to get serious with, with each other in this class, and you don't have to get serious with God in a large congregation. You can just worship, hit and run. Let me tell you, in a life transformation group with seven other people, you can't do that. And we are seeing incredible things happen as a result of confession of our sins with one another before God, true penitence. And that has made a huge change in my prayer life. Where I say, God, I get it. How much what I have done hurts you. And only then can I feel that my relationship with him has truly been righted. Think about that next week. Psalms 40 and 41. Heavenly Father, we come before you a broken people, Father. Not only sorry for our sins, but getting how much they cause you concern. Getting how much we've hurt you when we've disobeyed you. I thank you for a class that cares enough to study your word and watch it bloom in their lives, Father. And today, even as we pray for one of our brothers who, is, who has fallen ill today, Father, I want to pray for healing in his life and spiritual healing in the life of everyone within earshot. Father, please bless us as we go our separate ways today, because as always, we are people sharing Jesus. We do it in your name. Amen.